Maybe I can join these two videos together. This is the second part of, uh, of Maximum Marriage 4, dealing with headship and submission within marriage and what that looks like. If you didn't get a chance to see the first part, be sure to catch that. I'll try to uh, recap right now and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, the concept of, of headship within marriage, and by way of recap, is that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and that's a delegated authority that is given to the husband, but also there's an accountability that was given to the husband uh, so that so that he would be accountable on the judgment day for whatever decisions that he made. And the analogy that I was making before, before our, our uh, video uh, uh, live feed got interrupted was Ephesians 5, 23 through 25. It says, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands... Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, the concept of, of headship within marriage has been radically diminished within the current culture. And the reason it's been radically diminished is it's been really misapplied and misappropriated. There are some that would see that the headship of a husband as being kind of this dictatorial role, where, where this guy is an autocrat that just walks around barking out orders like a drill sergeant communicating to his, uh, his soldiers. Uh, and that's not, that's not the idea of somebody's barking out orders and not, or the idea of somebody that th this would be somebody that is uh, walking loudly and carrying a big stick. Somebody that is kind of abusing authority rather than using the authority properly. And then the other, the other way that we thought of it that was a misappropriation of it was a, a person who thought maybe he had to be perfect and was sort of struggling with perfection and kind of demanding that he be perfect and everybody around him be perfect. And the reality is biblical headship and submission has worked out in the day-to-day -day marriages of men and women across America who are going to work and coming home and dealing with the real issues of life. And so that means we're not going to do it perfectly. We will all struggle in this and it's something that we learn. And then the third guy is just a guy who has no idea what this means. I am the head. He's heard the concept, but he doesn't. He might parrot even some of the ideas and insights, but doesn't really understand what it means. Now, we're talking about two components within headship. And one is authority, delegated authority, like a police officer. We delegate authority to police officers to pull people that are speeding over so that we don't have more and more and more traffic fatalities. And we, the people, give them that authority to be able to uh, to take care of law enforcement issues. And we like it when they get the other guy. We don't always like it when they pull us over. But the reality is, when they pull us over, they're actually doing us a favor. I know sometimes that might be seem hard to remember when you're writing out the $92 ticket for going however fast you were going, but you need to remember that he's exercising the authority that you gave him as a citizen of the United States of America. He only has that authority because you gave him. He's not in authority just because he has on a uniform. He's not in authority just because he has a bigger gun than you have. He's in authority because you delegated that authority to him. Same way in marriage, the husband and wife together, they enter into a covenant called marriage, and in that covenant called marriage, God has designated the husband to be the head of the home. And as the head of the home, he gives ultimate, he has ultimate accountability before God for the nature of that relationship and what he did in that relationship and how he led that relationship. And so that authority, as they enter into this marriage contract, this marriage covenant, that there's a delegation on her part giving him that authority, but also acknowledging her working under that authority. And this, this working under this authority is a word that they talk about called submission. But as I pointed out in kind of the earlier segment of this that got cut off, submission was hypomone, and it had to do it had to do with an ordering under in a military structure so that there could be organization within a grouping of people. If you don't have order in a grouping of people, you have chaos and craziness that's there. And I used earlier the illustration of Gertrude, the two-headed coral snake out of Florida. A reporter had done a report on it. It had the same digestive tract. Uh, the, the, the two heads shared the same digestive tract, the same body, uh, this, all the same organs inside the body of the snake, but it had two heads with two mouths and two brains, 
And one of the things that was a struggle for the snake was determining whither to slither, the reporter said. And, and a two-headed marriage would have the same problem. You would have this constant conflict of two people going two different directions. So God established hypomone, which was an ordering under uh, of the authority of the, of the husband, so that the husband and wife operated together as this unit or team. And the analogy that I was making as well was that of a, a ship captain in the Navy, He's the authority that is on that ship, and that authority right under him is the XO, the, the executive officer. And that executive officer is the one that is charged with giving the, the, the captain alternative viewpoints, alternative plans, uh, m m increasing the captain's understanding of what's going on so that the, whatever decisions the captain makes, the captain makes them with clarity. There's nobody on that ship as important as the XO and the captain. They they play this dual role that's there, and, but ultimately the captain has to have the final say because he's going to have the final judgment if things go wrong. If that ship wrecks, the captain is held accountable, not the XO. And, and so that's kind of the best analogy that I can come up with in, in, in kind of just the secular culture, but, but it's this teamwork, this covenant relationship where two become one. And there's even a mutual submission that takes place. In the verses that we read earlier, um, in, in verse 21 of Ephesians 5, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of Lord. And so there's oftentimes, if that's a wise captain on that ship, he's going to listen to what the XO says, and there's going to be a lot of times he's going to do exactly what the XO says. And just as a husband, he's not going to just all the time, just because he thinks something that is always the right decision. He's going to learn to listen to his wife, tune into what her strengths are. Man, my wife is, is a lot smarter than me in a lot of areas, and I want to listen to what she has to say. She's a lot better than me at finances and details and stuff like that. And so if it were left up to me, I would know the power bill hadn't been paid when the lights turned off, you know, but, but so she's strong in certain areas. And if I'm a good, if I'm a good head of my house, even though I have the, the final say in things, I'm going to be wise and really pay close attention and, and follow a lot of what she says, submitting yourselves one to another and then following that concept that's there. So there's the issue of authority and accountability. And so the husband, he is a shock absorber. He is a, he, his job is to protect. His job is to provide for. Those, those are the roles that God has given to him. And, and he needs to lead that home into a, a spiritual growth so that all the children can grow up with the skills that they need and understandings that they need and, and the right attitudes and work ethics and those kind of things. Uh, those are the, the things that fall to that under the headship of the husband. And that's his responsibility. And he needs to take that seriously. And then, though, the, the husband as a sacrificial lover. The, the verses that we read... It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We are to love our wives sacrificially. That means that we're supposed to put them first and we're supposed to care for them. One of, one of my jobs is to, is to be sensitive to what's going on in my wife's world and to make certain that I'm helping her uh, achieve whatever it is that God ne needs her to achieve. And so if I'm sensing my wife is overwhelmed, I'm going to throw myself into helping her, whatever that looks like. Um, so right, right now, my wife and I both work outside of the home. And so if I can help with the, the dishes or, do, or cooking something or cleaning something or taking somebody somewhere, I, I'm going to throw myself into that because I, I don't want that load to weigh her down and be this crushing burden that she has to carry. She should know that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soldier beside her in this thing, and we're going to do this together. And there's kind of, I think, been a, a misunderstanding over the decades about that there's kind of this idea that there are certain chores around the house that, that are in and of themselves something that women should do, and there are other chores that only men should do. The reality is, man, if I'm looking at a, dish, a, a sink full of dishes, I'm going to do those dishes. These hands know how to scrubby-dub-dub, -dub, you know. Um, I, if, if a vacuum needs to be run, I know how to run a vacuum. If a, when we do chores at the house, one of the things that I do is the kids, the kids all have to clean their room. 
on, on Saturday morning. They will clean their room and also one other area of the house. I take three areas of the house. I, I take the three hardest areas of the house. I take two bathrooms and I take the kitchen because everybody hates the bathrooms and nobody wants to do all the pots and pans in the kitchen. And so I take the hardest areas and I lead by example. And then, then if they have any complaints, I offer to trade with them. So if you don't like the one area in the general area that I'm cleaning, I'll be glad to trade you. And they never take the trade. They just go do what it is that I have assigned to them. But I need to set the example and carry the load. There's no reason for me to sit on the couch and tell people what to do. I need to lead by example. And leadership and authority is by example. When you set the example and you set the pace, then your family is most likely to follow you. Now, that doesn't mean they won't. Uh, they will always follow you because rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child. And and they will they will sometimes buck and kick and squawk and try to get out of everything, but you have to set the example and do the very best that you can to provide a pattern for them. And, and so I, I need to come beside my wife whenever I can, helping her in any way that I possibly can. So that don't don't fall into the trap of these artificial distinctions. Like that's not my job, man. I I got a ton of kids around here. I can't sit around and expect my wife to do all that work. That's ridiculous. And quite honest, it's just wicked. And and I, I don't intend to do that, and I'm going to help whenever I can. Um, so living with sacrificial love, what that does is it keeps you as the head of the home from being a dictator, and it keeps your wife from being a doormat. It, it helps you to develop selflessness, and it helps her to deal with the issue of, of feeling that, like she's been subjugated. And it's a liberating thing when we have the proper kind of authority that leads by example as husbands when we're leading by example. And then when we're, when we're sacrificially giving to our mates and to our families, what that looks like is, is that helps them not to feel like that you think that they're your personal servants or something. Um, and then the relationship can grow at the place that it's supposed to. So real love isn't an attitude. It's also an action. Once you really are in love with someone, you're not going to bulk at doing the hard things. <laughs> the hard thing for me when I when we first started having kids was changing diapers. Dude, I got to tell you, that just grossed me out, man, changing diapers. That's nasty. But after Hannah came along, uh, I knew that I needed to change diapers because it was exhausting to my wife. And then we, we ended up having a ton of children over the years and and a lot, a lot of diapers. We still have an, an eight-year-old that's in diapers because he has profound autism. And uh, I change diapers every day. I change his diapers every day. Um, and so what I'm saying is you learn to do the things even that you might hate to do because you love your family. And you want to be a blessing to your family. Um, so if you're going to really be the head of your house, you need to learn to be on your wife's team. One husband had been working and setting up for a particular meeting for six months. He'd been planning it. Well, finally, the meeting is going on and he gets a call from his wife that she she's in tears because she's just found out that their daughter is going to have to wear leg braces for the next six months. And he is just encouraging her. He's, he's broke away from the meeting. He's encouraging her and he asks her, says, do you, do you need me to come home? Now, he's planned six months for this meeting, but he's offering to come home and be with her. And she says, no, no, I'm okay. I just need to know that you're on my on my team, you know, that you're, that you're here for me. Look, guys, you, your wife wants to know you're there for her. I mean, she needs to know that you got her back. She needs to know she's not in this thing all alone. And I end up talking to uh, frustrated wives all the time because they think, that their husband's not invested in the relationship. And I've seen some of them not be. I mean, I've seen some of them, their only contribution to the home is they hold the couch down to the floor while watching TV while the wife is doing all of this stuff. And and I think that we need to be careful that that's not the case. Now, I'm not saying that's every guy. I'm, I'm, a lot of my a lot of my friends are really, really good about helping and, and really, really good about investing in the home and taking care of things. And man, that's wonderful. But boy, if that's not you, it's time to buck up and get her done, buddy. Get her done. Do it. Um, so, explode your expectations. You, you will never be a, a, as appreciated as much as you think you should. You will never be as appreciated as much as you think you should. That's just a truth of life. <laughs> Most of the stuff that you do will go unnoticed until the day you die, and then everybody will realize what you brought to the table. That's a sad truth, but it's the truth. And 
And so uh, <laughs> the Big Yellow Taxi is a song that's about that. It says they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. And it's the idea that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And But you, you won't be appreciated as much as you think you should be. Here's a couple of truths. Number one, men remember the good things they do for a long time. Number two, women remember the dumb things men do for a long time. And we need to be careful. Somehow that creates a mixture of frustration where where the guy's remembering all the good things that he did and that she doesn't remember. And she's remembering all the bad things that he did and she's not remembering the good things. We need to be sure that we get rid of the expectations of appreciation. But no, I would say, though, that you need to be as appreciative as you can be towards your mate. Whatever that looks like, you need to speak appreciation, man. Whenever my wife does something, I try to thank her for it because she went out of her way to do something for me. She made meatloaf the other night. I love meatloaf, dude. It's one of my favorite foods. And she made that. She didn't have to make that, but she made it for me because she knows it's one of the things that I love. So thank the people around you regularly. Speak appreciation to them. And then uh, a, a poor investment. Um... Sometimes when there's a problem, if you're the man, a problem crops up in your wife's life, you tend to think, well, that's not my problem. You know, I, I uh, you know, that that's somebody else's. What One of the things that I found helps me is if I say, what, what have I done that has contributed to this problem that my wife is having? And what I found most often, it's not true 100% of the time, but most of the time, uh, relationships consist of a team of two people, and often there was stuff that I was doing that was exacerbating this situation and making it worse, that was aggravating the situation and making it worse. And so if I can learn to ask the question, what did I, what did I do that might have contributed to this situation that has developed that is frustrating my wife or hurting my wife, then I can begin to rectify whatever my part in it was. But if I just sort of go, well, that's not my problem, and I just sort of pull away from it and don't do anything, and, and she's got to try to figure it out and fight this battle all on her own, that's not being a good husband. But being a good husband is coming alongside her saying, man, I'm sorry if I, if I made this situation worse. I apologize. Sometimes I can be a dunderhead. Um, you know, and, and, and I, need to, I need you to forgive me. What can we do better here? Now, how can I help you? And, and so she may just want you to listen, but she may also want you to do something. And if she does, then you need to jump on it and get, get her done so that your team can function effectively. Here's, here's a, here, this, this is worth its weight in gold. This will help you. If, if you don't do anything else for your marriage, if you can do just this one thing, it will begin to turn some things around. There's a crunch time. It happens every day in, in families, especially families with children, happens about four o'clock until bedtime. And when the kids come tumbling in from school and they start slinging their backpacks and their shoes and their clothes and everything everywhere, wanting snacks, leaving junk everywhere, they, they you know, they're, you know, the wife gets home and so she's, she's trying to sort out what she's going to do for dinner and uh, meanwhile, the kids are coming asking her questions every 23 seconds. And, and the husband finally comes in home. And then he sort of wanders over to his lazy boy recliner, or as he thinks of it, his throne, and flicks on the, 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 the uh, dummy tube and, and sits there watching TV. Uh, all the while, the chaos is kind of going on around him. And she's taking care of everything. She's set the table. Uh, she's helping the kids with the homework. She's, uh, she's doing all that stuff. And then finally, you know, dinner's on. He... He was for dinner, and then she says, you know, meat love. He's, oh, not again, you know, and grumbles and then staggers again back to the lazy boy recliner and uh, and so on. And you see how that, that plays out. So this this creates a resentment, that this, uh, this being unplugged during this hard time in, in the day, and that goes on for like five days of the week. And then Saturday, maybe it's some of the same, but the crunch time is not quite as bad as it is. Monday through Friday, but husband, if you'll at least be invested in, in that crunch time, if you'll step into the pit that your wife feels like she's in all alone, and you step beside her and you go, what can I do? And she says, hey man, uh, Johnny's having trouble with his spelling words, will you help him? And you go over and you help Johnny with the spelling words. And it says, you know, what can I do? Hey, I need the laundry hauled upstairs, and you haul the laundry upstairs. My wife sometimes bans me from the laundry because it turns out that I turned a couple of white loads pink by adding some red thing in it, and that... Apparently, that really torques ladies. I did not know that. But anyway, I, I, I do laundry now, but I'm much more careful about that white stuff, man. Um, but anyway, find out what she needs and, and throw yourself in there during the pit time. And then it feels like that you're a team working together to accomplish this thing called family. And that's a covenant relationship between the two of you. You're the head. 
She's the wife, and the two of you working together. You're the you're the captain. She's the executive officer, and and you're you're working together to accomplish these kingdom purposes. Um, so be a shock absorber, be a protector, be a provider, be a leader for your family, and lead sacrificially. Pour yourself out in love for your family. Let's pray, dear Lord God. I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive my stammering tongue and the cutting out of video and all of that that happens when you're trying to articulate God's truth. I pray that you'd help us to move into the place where both man and wife are accomplishing your roles and goals for our marriages, God. And this is only going to work right if we do it your way. If we try to operate this thing called marriage in our own strength and our own wisdom, it's doomed to fail because we're not bright enough and we're not strong enough and quite honestly, we're not dedicated enough apart from you motivating us. God, help us to be the men and women that we need to be to pull off this thing called marriage. The world could look at our marriage and see a reflection of the church's relationship to Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've done. Be with us in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.